Well, I hope if you call New City Church home, you were encouraged by that video. What you see over and over again is, is friendship, it's community, it's helping people walk with Jesus. And that's attributed to you and how you serve and how you give and how you love and how you forgive one another and how we might have political differences and uh, different you know, allegiances or uh, ideologies or things that we like. But we have found something greater than all those things, and that's Jesus. And so thank you. Uh, for five years, it's been pretty incredible for me that we're still here, and I'll share some stories as we go on a bit, a little bit. But I just want to say thank you for what you do, uh, for making this possible, and for allowing us to play a small part in God's kingdom here in Raleigh with the time that he has us here on this earth. And so thank you for what, for what you do. Um, I was also asked this morning by somebody when they came in, they said, Dylan, um, you know, when politicians uh, on election night they uh, typically prepare two speeches, a victory speech and a concession speech. And he said, did you prepare your speeches? Now, if you don't know what I'm talking about, don't worry about it. Um, if you do know what I'm talking about, you probably want, want me to know, make me a comment about what happened last night. And all I'm going to say is, ain't no devil going to hold me down today. Okay? Know what I'm saying? So that's right. Amen. So let's talk about the good stuff, all right? We'll be in Mark chapter 10. So if you have a Bible, go ahead and grab one. Uh, if you don't, there's a black one around you. If you do not own a Bible, we would love for you to take one of those home. It is our gift to you. We are in Mark chapter 10 this morning. Uh, we've been in Mark for a while. We're going to take a little break on Easter and then after Easter and then get back into it. We'll finish it up later this year. Uh, the gospel of Mark is the story of Jesus. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the New Testament are the four gospels. They're telling us about the life, death, resurrection of Jesus. And so we've been reading about Mark uh, for a while to now. And today we're going to be in Mark chapter 10 verse 32. Uh, last week, uh, if you were here, we saw one of the well-known interactions between Jesus and a rich young ruler when Jesus essentially told him to sell everything and come and follow me because he wanted to reveal to this man who had a lot of money and did a lot of good things that he was still trusting in himself and his possessions and not him. And so we're not going to recap all of that there, but verse 31, it ended that exchange where Jesus was talking to his disciples. They were kind of taken aback about what Jesus taught. And what did he tell them? He said, in my kingdom, Many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. It's this idea of the upside-down kingdom of how God has asked us to live and operate and is a much different way than how you might uh, initially think you should live and how the world teaches us to live. And so with that thought, we're going to continue this morning in Mark chapter 10, starting in verse 32. Here is what happens next. It says this. It says, they were on the road. Now, they here is the disciples and Jesus going up to Jerusalem. Jesus was walking ahead of them. The disciples were astonished, but those who followed him were afraid. Taking the 12 aside again, he began to tell them these things that would happen to him. Now, I don't know what the disco light's happening right now, but it's okay. We're going to go with it. Does anyone else see that? Is that just me? Just me? Okay, good. That's good. Um, here's what's happening here. Uh, Jesus is continuing uh, his journey towards Jerusalem. And so, right, what's happening now is Jesus is going towards Jerusalem where he is ultimately going to give his life. Now, he's already shared twice before that he was going to suffer and die. And so this is now the third time, what's called the, th the three passion predictions in the gospel of Mark, where Jesus is telling his disciples what is going to happen to him. So they're going towards Jerusalem. Jesus is leading the way to his suffering. And it says the disciples were astonished, likely knowing, still somewhat confused, but bad things are about to happen. And yet with confidence, he is still leading us. And it says the crowd was afraid. So when Jesus traveled with his disciples, it wasn't typically just the 12. There was typically other people that kind of followed along with them. And so the rest of the people are afraid. Again, it doesn't tell us why. It might be because they're afraid of the fighting or the revolution that's going to break out. They're going to uh, Jerusalem um, during uh, the Passover, which is when everybody, there's maybe up to a million people might go to Jerusalem at the week of Passover. There's a lot of stuff coming. We've already read before how some people are trying to make Jesus king. And so there's these political undertones, even though Jesus has tried to deny those things because they're trying to make Jesus king by force, which is not what he came to do. And so they're afraid. And they're also afraid because if Jesus gets killed, and in, in the ancient world, if you were kind of the supporter of someone who was defeated, you would also be killed to make sure they would stamp out any possible uprising that came of it. So they're afraid. They have no idea what's going to happen. And then it says this, verse 33. Jesus says this, See, we are going up to Jerusalem. The Son of Man, which is himself, will be handed over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death. Then they will hand him over to the Gentiles. And they will mock him, spit on him, flog him, and kill him, and he will rise after three days. 
So again, this is the third time Jesus predicts his death. This is the most, this third and final time. Mark gives us the most detail, or Jesus explains in the most detail what is going to happen. It says he's going to be given over, given over to the religious leaders, as we're going to see, who want to kill him. And because they want to kill him, they then have to hand him over to the Gentiles or the non-Jews, which would be the Romans, to actually make that happen. Now, you might be wondering, why is that the case? Well, there was a lot, there was a heavy Jewish population in Rome, particularly in the Israel. In Israel area. And so uh, they were given special privileges. In the New Testament, if you ever read about the Sanhedrin, for example, uh, that was really the law, the council, the Jewish people. And they were allowed to govern themselves in a lot of ways. One of the things, however, that they were not allowed to do was execute capital punishment. They had to, that was only by the Roman governing authorities. They were the only ones that could do that. They were the only ones that could put people to death. And so if they ever had a situation where they thought someone deserved to die, they would have to make the case to the Roman authorities. Authorities. And so that's what's going to happen, right? Jesus gets arrested by some of the religious leaders who want to kill him. They kind of do their own trial thing and they find him guilty uh, or they suppose that he is guilty. So they hand him over to the Romans with Pontius Pilate and they try to uh, convince him to have Jesus killed. And Jesus is saying that is what's going to happen. But we know as followers of Jesus, that won't be the end. Jesus is telling his disciples he will defeat death and rise again. Now, this is encouraging news for us. But the disciples, again, they cannot comprehend how this is actually going to happen, right? Dead people don't come back to life. And so as much as Jesus has tried to tell them what's going to happen, they still don't fully understand because nobody could fully understand what he was going to do until after he saw, did it and they witnessed it firsthand. So he explains it to them. And then as their journey, perhaps a little bit later on, it says this in verse 35. It says, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, so two of Jesus' disciples, approached him and said, Teacher, we want you to do whatever we ask of you. So they have a request of Jesus. Verse 36, what do you want me to do for you? He asked them. So Jesus responded. Verse 37, they answered him, allow us to sit at your right and at your left in your glory. And so as they continue the journey, James and John have a request, which is essentially when Jesus is going to be made king, we're not sure how this is going to happen, but you keep saying it's going to happen. We want to be placed in the highest positions of honor in your kingdom. Now, this is not maybe too far out of line because we know that James and John and Peter, uh, one of the other disciples, were Jesus' closest three disciples. So he had his 12, but then he had his three that he spent even more time with and had a few extra privileges or saw a few extra things that the other disciples didn't. And so they're probably thinking, you know, we're one of his closest anyway, so let's kind of seal the deal. Uh, before things get really crazy, let's ask him and let's kind of solidify this, that we are going to be on his right and on his left. Um, and so they do that. Of course, we, this is what's interesting is this again happens after Jesus explains how he will suffer and die. When Jesus, again, the humble servant, is again asked by his disciples to be made great. Now, I don't know if you've been tracking with this, but there are three times, as we've said, that Jesus predicts his own death and suffering. And every single time after that, you then have the disciples arguing amongst themselves how they can be great. Or in this case, literally asking Jesus to make them great. Right? Mark is showing us the this, this supreme uh, irony or disconnect that you and I can have as we, as we follow Jesus, but if we get things twisted and kind of make it about our self, right? they're missing the point. They are so concerned about their own greatness that they're missing what Jesus is demonstrating for them by literally laying his life down, becoming a servant for them. And I think it's worth us pointing out as we see what's going on here, this important reality that wanting something from Jesus is not the same thing as wanting Jesus. Wanting something from Jesus is not the same thing as wanting Jesus, right? And it can look good, and maybe you can dress it up in, in spiritual language, or maybe you can look good to other people, but you and I know, are we follow, if you're a follower of Jesus this morning, are you following him because of who he is or what you think you might be able to get from him? I don't know why this came up for me, but uh, speaking about doing something that maybe looks good, even though it's not really like the, your motivation probably isn't the best. I remember when I was uh, working at Verizon years ago before we planted New City, and I did not like it at all. Uh, people got very angry, and I get your cell phone bill is probably one of your biggest bills, but when you're the reason that you broke your phone or you did this or whatever, don't yell at me, right? I get you're frustrated, but it ain't my fault. 
And so people were just, they were mad. You would be surprised. People were mad all the time. And so there were times, it was rare, uh, but there were times where um, uh, people would come in and they would want like an iPad or a phone or a, like a device that wasn't in our store. And so we would look it up and we could go pick it up for them in one of the you know, stores closer to us. And so this didn't happen often, but whenever it did, I always volunteered to be the person to go and drive and go pick up the thing and bring it back to our store. Right now, it looks because oh, he's just a nice work coworker. He's trying to help us out. He, the reason I wanted to do it was to get out of there. Right? It wasn't because I actually wanted to be of help. It's because I wanted to do whatever I could to be paid, but not have to be in that building. Right? That's what was happening there. And I just say that to say that we can follow Jesus, maybe for things that we want or things that we think we should be able to get, but we're not actually following Him. We're not actually wanting. Him. And of course, the disciples have shown us that they care about Jesus, they follow Jesus, uh, they are imperfect like us. But in this particular moment, they are more focused on what they can get than, the, than actually experience Jesus himself. And so we'll continue reading. Here's what happens next. Here's Jesus' response, verse 38. It says, Jesus said to them, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the bapti- baptism I and baptism, baptized with, right? And so like us, the disciples can be quick to want the, uh, uh, sorry, quick to want, quick to want the benefit of something or the benefit of God's kingdom in this particular situation while being slow to understand the, co- the cost of participating in it, right? The reality is they don't actually know what they are asking for. They just want the benefits of being elevated in God's kingdom. They want the benefits of being, look how great I am, without actually understanding what it takes to actually be great in God's kingdom. Now, as a side note, it's worth pointing out, the cup in the Old Testament, as Jesus is referring to here, uh, typically symbolizes something that belonged to God. Now, not always, but most often it was referring to God's wrath against sin and evil. That, his, that how, how he has wrath and against sin and evil and how he wants to make it right. And so what Jesus is saying, he's using the metaphor of baptism by saying the suffering and death that I am about to experience will take place in the place of humanity that I'm going to be a sacrifice to them. And despite what the disciples are going to say in a second, they cannot fully experience Jesus's cup. However, they will experience his suffering. In other words, they can't do what he is going to do but they can, as they follow him and as they do experience suffering and as they do elevate other people above themselves, that is how they can participate in the kingdom of God. Now, I don't know if you've ever been in a situation like this where you wanted something, but you didn't fully understood, understand what it would take to get it. Right? I think all of us have maybe have desires or things that we have wanted in the past or we want in the future, and, but we were kind of naive and partially is, if you haven't been through it, maybe you don't know, as all that would take for you to actually get that thing. So for me, especially we're talking about five years at New City, um, when I was in college was the time that I thought maybe ministry is what I want to do. There was a couple of significant things that happened in my life and I was like, yeah, ministry, yeah, I think I'll do that. So I switched degrees uh, to religion, started studying religion and started, you know, getting even more involved at our church, to try to serve more and learn and watching, you know, other pastors and podcasts and reading books. And I remember thinking like, yeah, I'm sure there's hard things about being a pastor. Like there's hard things about any job, but it's gotta be really cool that you get like preach the Bible every week and you get to like spend time meeting with people like that seems like it's a pretty awesome gig, right? And hear me, it is an honor to do what I get to do. I mean, it is more full than I could have ever imagined. But as I think back to my time, you know, back in college, and as I talk to church planners now that want to plant, I tell them that being a preacher is not the same thing as being a pastor. That you can preach and get in front of people, but you have no idea what it actually means to care for people, uh, to walk through deep grief and suffering with people when you fall short and you have to ask forgiveness, when people are upset with you for any other, any number of reasons. Just wanting to do what I'm doing here on Sunday morning is an important part of your job. But there is so much more that you actually have no idea what you are going to step into. And that's okay, but you don't know yet. And that's what Jesus is saying to them, that I'm going to invite you in to what I'm doing. But be careful because you don't know what you're asking. You don't know what you are asking. And so I think for us, it's a good thing for us. To, if, you're, if you would say you're a follower of Jesus this morning, here's a good question for you and for me, right? Do you understand what it means to follow Jesus? Do you understand what it means to follow Jesus? And when I say you, I mean me too, 
right? Me too. Is it just about, hey, I'm going to do the right things and maybe go to church or pray or give money or whatever, forgive people, because I guess that's what the thing we're supposed to do, because God wants me to do it and it's the right thing to do, or maybe so that God will love me more, or is it something else? Is it actually following Jesus for experiencing him? Do you understand what it actually means to follow Jesus? Jesus is going to explain it for the disciples and for us. And here's, how he, here's what he says. He continues in verse 9, verse 39, rather. So he asked the disciples, are you able to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? 39, it says this, we are able, they told him. Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink, and you will be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. So they're saying, yes, we want to do whatever it is that you're asking us to do. Now, they think they are ready. And as the example I've just showed, maybe there are examples in your life where you think you are ready, but you have no way of truly knowing until you actually do it. Or you are, think you are ready, but you don't actually know what that means. However, Jesus, knowing that they don't fully understand what they're asking, still encourages them to follow him. And if they do, instead of being elevated about, look how great I am, they will experience suffering and they will experience sacrifice and not to the same level of Jesus, but in some cases to the same degree in the sense of that they will also eventually be killed. We know historically the disciples were killed for claiming that Jesus actually rose from the dead. And so Jesus here is inviting them to join in this suffering that comes for living for God and not for yourself. And so Jesus says, I invite you and you will do this. And so they're probably thinking, awesome. Like, okay, we're going to suffer. We're going to do whatever he asks. So then we are going to sit on his right and his left. We are going to be elevated. It's going to be hard, but it's going to be worth it, right? Well, here is what Jesus then says in verse 40. He says, but to sit at my right or left is not mine to give. Instead, it is for those for whom it has been prepared. Now, real quick, I want to explain something called the Trinity here, which is confusing because we are humans and we are not God. But in the, in the Trinity, you have God the Father, you have God the Son, who is Jesus, and God the Holy Spirit. You have three distinct beings, yet at the same time are one being that we can't fully understand completely. Now, what that means is that when Jesus was on the earth, he was 100% God and 100% man. But very clearly, there are times where certain things about his divinity or certain things that he knew about maybe when he was not on earth, he did not know about when he was on earth. And that might make us uncomfortable, but it's just how it was. So for example, at one point when, when people were talking about when he was going to return, when Jesus was going to return the second time to judge the living and the dead and to reignite his kingdom for all of creation, he told the people that he did not know when it would be. So as a side note, listen, if Jesus didn't know when it was going to be when he was on earth, you and I don't know either, okay? So just, just a side note, we don't know, right? Here, we also see that Jesus is saying, in this instance, it is not my, uh, my uh, role to grant to you. In fact, all of Jesus' life, he says multiple times, is to submit himself to the will of God the Father. In fact, in John chapter 6, Jesus said this, For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. He said, my job, my role right now is to give my life for you, not to hand out awards about who gets to be the greatest. That is not the point of why I came. And so the disciples here and us are not to follow Jesus, hear me, because we know in advance what will happen or what we hope to get. We don't follow Jesus thinking, hey, if I do this, then I'm going to get all of these things. Instead, faithfully following Jesus means following Jesus regardless of the outcome. That's what it means. It does not mean, hey, I'm going to do these things with the hope that if I do X, Y, and Z, then God is going to do for me what I want. In fact, one of the biggest struggles that you and I have if you're a follower of Jesus is that when you and I get angry with God for not doing what God never promised to do, he never promised to answer all our prayers. He never promised we wouldn't have suffering. Now, he does promise some really great things for us, both in this life and in the life to come. But oftentimes, you and I can get frustrated, and I get it. I get it when life is hard. But we can get frustrated with God when he didn't make a promise, that he, he didn't break a promise that he didn't actually make. Right? And here's what I know. Like, from personal experience, maybe if you're a follower of Jesus, you might be able to relate to this. Like, like I know, I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where you're like, God, I'll do whatever you ask me to do as long as everything will work out in the end, right? Like I will do whatever. 
as long as I know that it will work. So this happens to me. Um, again, if you want to talk about New City, I remember about six, seven years ago when we were raising money and trying to build a team and, and trying to get ready to plant New City Church. Um, I, I remember um, sitting there and asking, begging God, like, I don't know if this is going to work, but God, I'll do whatever you want. I will have all those awkward fundraising conversations. Um, I will go, I will have all these events where no one shows up to and be, feel like embarrassed. Um, I will, you know, plan all this stuff. I'll I'll do whatever you want as long as it will work out, right? As long as you promise that New City is going to survive, work, like our kids are going to be able to eat, like as long as everything works out the way that I want it to work out, I'll do anything you ask me to do. However, we know that that is not how life works. See, in that situation, it wasn't me just trying to be faithful. It was me trying to do the right things to ensure I got the outcome that I wanted. And what Jesus is trying to tell us here and what he's showing us in this text is that Jesus is, not, is the end. He's not the means. Jesus is, not, is the end. He's not the means. He is not the person, the God, the deity, the whatever you might want to call him in order to get the things that you want. He is not those things. He is someone that we follow and experience him for who he is, right? We follow Jesus for his grace, for his love, for his forgiveness, right? To experience his kingdom. We don't follow Jesus for pride. We don't follow Jesus for recognition. We don't follow Jesus so that he can somehow elevate us. We follow Jesus for who he is. And as we've seen throughout the gospel of Mark, the kingdom, Jesus' kingdom is an upside down kingdom. He does not operate the way you and I think we should operate, about power or force and money and elevating ourselves. It is about denying ourselves, following the example of Jesus for the good and for the love of other people. Following Jesus, hear me this morning, it is hard. It is hard, but it is worth it. Following Jesus is hard, but it is worth it. And so just as a side note, if you're thinking, man, I want to experience Jesus for who he is and his love and his grace and not for what I can get. How can I do that? Well, real quickly, one of the things I just want to invite you to do, again, as you leave today, you will get one of these five days of prayer and fasting cards. I would invite you this week to take some time to ask Jesus to love and to encourage you and to give his grace to you, that you might experience him in a special way. And so these cards, we've got five things that you can pray for over these next couple of days. And we would encourage you to do some sort of uh, dietary fast, whether it's a couple of days of complete fasting, maybe it's fasting from a meal or two a day, or maybe from a, a dietary restriction, a certain type of food group, whatever it might be. I would encourage you to participate in that so that you can experience who Jesus is because he is the end. He is not the means to the end. And so that being said, let's continue to see what happens next. Verse 41. So this is funny, right? James and John thinks things are going to work out for them. And then they find, oh, there's not. And then something else happens. Verse 41. When the 10 disciples heard this, so when they figure out whatever, when they hear what's going on, it says this. They began to be indignant with James and John. They began to be indignant with James and John. In other words, the other disciples get upset. Now hear me. They are not upset because they finally understand that they're supposed to be kind and loving and that they're mad at James and John for being prideful. That's not what they're upset about. They are upset because they also want to be elevated like Jesus. And if James and John get to sit at the right and at the left, then they don't get to sit at Jesus' right and the left. So they're not like James and John. We've got to do better. Like, this is not what he wants. This is James and John. If you guys are the best, then we can't be the best. That's why they are mad, right? They, and this, again, this is, we know this too because this is the third time This is the third time the disciples have argued about who's going to be the greatest. They still have not understood what he is saying. And so because of that, Jesus uses this opportunity to again explain to them what following him looks like and what the kingdom of God is like. And he says this in verse 42. Mark 10, verse 42, it says this. Jesus called them over and said to them, so all of his disciples, everyone who's listening, what's going on? He said, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those in high positions act as tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. On the contrary, whoever wants to become great among you will be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you will be a slave to all. So again, what Jesus does here is he uses this dispute to teach them again for the third time about what the kingdom of God is actually 
like. That again, it is not like this world where people seek positions of power and authority and influence and income for their own glory and their own ends. Jesus says, it is not so among you. It is not so among those who are part of my kingdom, not just my future kingdom when I make all things right, but even now, even now. I love what one scholar says, it'll be on the screen, uh, in the screen, talking about what Jesus is saying here. He puts it this way. He says, at no place do the ethics of the kingdom of God clash more vigorously with the ethics of the world than in the matters of power and service. This is the ultimate example of what God would want for us and how we often do the opposite. That the most prominent virtue in God's kingdom is not power or maybe in our context and as Americans, it's not freedom, it's service. Ironically, what Jesus is telling us again is that greatness belongs to those who act like slaves. That might make, does that make you feel uncomfortable? I don't know. Act like slaves in service towards others. Hear me. Here, here's what I know. Love sounds really great in theory. This is what it actually looks like. Put another way, in the kingdom of God, love is service. Love is service. Now, I just want to say this. What Jesus defines as love is not at all what our culture defines as love, right? Love is a value, equality, treating people with respect and dignity. Amen. That's a good thing that we should pursue. But here is how our culture defines love. Be kind to people. Don't be mean to people. Um, don't try not to be hurtful. Do whatever you want as long as it doesn't hurt anybody else, as if decisions are ever made in a vacuum. That, that never happens. But it's this whole idea, as long as you're nice to me, then I'll be nice to you. That is not love. Love is sacrifice. Love is forgiveness. Love as a follower of Jesus, if you're a follower of Jesus, is restricting your freedom for the good of others. What this means is that you might find yourself in situations where you might want something that is not wrong, that is not illegal, that is not bad in any way that you don't get to participate in because you want to care for somebody else. And by you doing that thing, and by you following that thing, or by you pursuing that thing, you cannot love the person right in front of you. Now, I'm not saying you can't have desires and things you want to pursue. Absolutely. But in God's kingdom, it's just because I have the ability and I'm free to do something, there will be times where I don't get to do it because I want someone else to experience God's love the way he has given it to me. Love does not mean I will be nice to you if you are nice to me. Love as defined by Jesus is I will give my life for you even if you hate me, even if you mock me, even if literally you want me to die. I will love you and give my life to you. Now, if I can, real quickly, here's what I know. Uh, New City exists because imperfectly, right? None of us are perfect, but imperfectly, we have so many stories of you doing this, of you loving and caring and putting your preferences and your financial desires and what you want behind other people. I could spend the next hour giving you stories. I'm not going to do that, but I just want to give you a couple of ones that came to mind. And I'm going to use people's names, and no, I did not ask for permission, because I want you to hear what people have done. I mean, even just a couple of things, I'll do these quickly, the things that came to mind this week. I think of April, who a couple of months ago said, hey, I want to start this women's gathering every month. And I'm like, sure, great. People want to start stuff all the times, but then they don't keep doing it, so go for it. She's been doing it every single month. The next one is next Sunday after service. They're, sitting, they're, they're uh, making bl no-sew blankets for foster care children here in Raleigh. Every month, she's been gathering women together here at the church, doing an amazing job, costing her time and money. Loving people well. Um, I think of Don and Tina. If you know Don and Tina, they are the sweetest people you will ever meet. Always talking about how they can pray. Always telling me how you guys have made a difference in their life. Always showing up. Always going above and beyond. I think of someone like Fred, who most of you do not know and never will know. He served on, as, as on our management team for the first three years of our church before we held elders. He doesn't come to this church, but he gave financially and twice a month. He would gather with us to talk about financial accountability and other th all these church-related things because he loves Jesus and he wants to see his name put forward. Um, I think of people in the band and production. Listen, you might not know this. They are here longer than, all, than any of us on a, on a Sunday morning. And they also have to come in on a Wednesday night. And the sound person has to come in on a Wednesday night to prepare worship for us. And I'm just going to say this. It's not a competition, but we have some of the best worship for a church our size in the country. I'm just going to, like, It's amazing. It's amazing. Because they, and then they've got to practice before they even show up here. Why? Because they love us and they want us to bring us into experience God's kingdom. I think of a guy like Tyler who makes all of our, well, most of our graphics here, all the good ones, he makes them. 
all of the time. Sometimes if they're not good, it was like a last minute thing. Hey, we got to figure this out. For completely for free, using his skill set and his gifts to serve the kingdom. I think of people like Dave and Kara, Greg and Tracy, Santi and Emily, Debbie, Brian and Brittany, uh, Barbara and John, uh, Jason, Delyn, Christina, Ryan and Kyle, who were all here our very first service five years ago. And they're still here. Can we get an amen for them? Right? We wouldn't be here five years. They have faithfully shown up. I also, speaking of Barbara, listen, if you don't know Barbara, here's the thing. She knows you. You know how I know this? Because there are times like when I or the staff is like, who is that person? She knows who you are, even if you've never talked to her. She, every, even when she's not serving, I'll be at the front door normally before service, right? And she's like, if someone's new, she's there, she's talking to them, asking if they have any questions, do they know where the kid space is? That is somebody who loves and serves. I think of John, who a couple of weeks ago, John works at construction. He says, hey, I'm going to show up on this place. I'm going to show up to church on this day at this time. Tell me whatever needs to be fixed. I'll go to Lowe's, get the stuff, and I'll come back and fix it because somebody wanted to use their gifts and talents to make this place a place where people can experience Jesus. I think of all of you who serve in New City Kids and the ones that are serving in there right now, who make a difference in the lives of our kids. We saw in the video of kids getting baptized. My daughter is getting baptized here today because of you. And hear me, if, you, if you're wondering where's the biggest impact I can make serving at New City Church, it's right over there. Amen. New City, listen to me, New City Church would not exist if it wasn't for people who faithfully served kids, because that is my story. You would not be here today if it wasn't for people like you and those that are serving in New City Kids. And I'm just going to say that is one of our biggest needs right now. If you're looking for a place to serve once a month, that is where you'll change people's life. I think of a guy named Brian, not on staff Brian, but another Brian who showed up to New City about 15 months ago and is dove head first into production, helped us figure out all of our live stream stuff, all of our sound stuff, all of our light stuff has been absolutely amazing. I think of all of you who have faithfully given to New City Church. There's so many stories I could share, but let me just say this. We moved into this building the week before COVID hit. Our rent more than doubled. We should not be here. We should not be in this building. And yet you guys lovingly sacrifice financially to create a place where people can meet Jesus and grow in a relationship with him. I think of all the meal trains and all the serving opportunities that are organically popping up in our congregation when people have babies, when people go through tragedies, when people need help, because we're trying to love each other the way Christ has loved us. Here's, uh, and, uh, there's so many things I could say. Here's the last story I'll share. I want to share this one. Uh, it was an email I got last year for New City's fourth anniversary, but I think it sums up so well that, what, what's true about this place. Uh, somebody sent this to me. They said, while watching the church's four-year anniversary Sunday message, we realized how much we have grown since attending this church. We've also experienced more financial blessings since we have been attending New City than we have in a long time. We just wanted to express to you how much our lives have been impacted by this church and by this church family. Our desire is to support you and me by, me, by mean they, they mean the church in any way we can in regards to the mission of New City, that is to bring people into a relationship with Jesus and to see them grow in a deeper relationship with him. That is what happens when we elevate true love and what it looks like to actually serve people well. And our sinfulness and our imperfections uh, and all these things, in spite of all these things, God still invites us to love people the way he loved us. And how does Jesus love us? Well, here's how he loves us. Verse 45, the last verse we'll read, Mark chapter 10, it says this. Here's why Jesus tells them it's about serving, not about your own greatness. Verse 45, for even the Son of Man, this is Jesus, did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Uh, listen, this morning, Jesus, unlike any other historical figure that has ever lived, does not just say, here's what you need to do to get, to get on God's good side, or here's what you need to do to get to the happy place when you die. That's not why he came. He does what you have to do. He doesn't just say, hey, go and do it. He says, come and follow me as I do it to a better, greater degree than you ever could. That's who he is. He came to serve like a slave to die for no benefit of his own. Hear me. Uh, God does not need you. There is something that you can offer him that he can't get for himself. He, the only reason he came, you want to know why he came for us? I actually have no idea. Like, I, I, don't, I'm not, I don't know. We betray him. We go our own way. We're sinful. There is nothing we can give him that he does not already have by himself, and yet he came. Why? The only reason can be because he loves us, because he loves you. 
right? Here's what he said. He came to give his life as a ransom for many. Now, for is the Greek word anti, where we get anti from. It means instead of, or in place of, or as a substitute, that he came in our place to be our ransom. Now, ransom here is the Greek word lutron, which means ransom. It means to set free. It means redeem. It means to deliver. It means to pay the price for. Now, it doesn't just mean these things. In an ancient world, there was actually a specific context that would come to mind. When you ransom somebody in the ancient world, you, what that was talking about specifically was ransoming a slave. It was somebody who would make a sacrificial payment that matched the value for or paid the debt of a slave in order to secure their freedom. Right? Because a lot of people entered into indentured servitude because they had debts they could not pay. And so you would have someone do for you what you could never do for yourself. You would have someone who paid a debt for you for whatever reason that you could never pay back so that you could experience freedom. And Jesus invites us to live in a way of service to others because here is why, because of why he came. And this is why he came. Jesus came to pay your ransom. That's why he came. That's why we celebrate five years. Not just to be nice to each other, or not just to celebrate when things are good, and to hug each other when things are bad. We exist to make it possible for people to meet and grow with the one who came to pay their ransom. He paid it, which means, you know what this means? One, one of the things we say often here at New City Church, that if you are a follower of Jesus, you have nothing to prove and you have no one to impress because he proved it all on the cross. And if you are a follower of Jesus, you are a son or a daughter of the king. You are blameless, you are righteous, you are holy and you are pure, not because of you, but because of him. And look right at me. If you do not yet know Jesus this morning, that is not true of you. You have everything to prove and you have everyone to impress. Good luck. Because here's what we all know, that weight crushes all of us. None of us are perfect. All of us have shame. All of us have regret. And Jesus came to do for us what we could not do for ourselves, to say, I'm going to take it on the cross for you. All you have to do is realize, be honest about your brokenness, and follow me. And I will give you grace. And I will give you mercy. And I will give you love. And how does he do it? By laying his life down like a slave. Why does he do it? <laughs> I have no idea, other than he clearly loves us. And Jesus is the only one who could pay it for us. Hey, thanks so much for checking out this video. We upload new videos every week to help encourage you and your faith in Jesus. So be sure to subscribe to this channel so that you'd never miss a thing.